skyscrapers can be standoffish sometimes. How can tall buildings be better citizens, essentially? I think uh, skyscrapers are standoffish because we conceive of them as standoffish. We design them as objects in the urban landscape. We bring them down to the ground. We then have sometimes a podium and sometimes not. But we need to start thinking about towers as building blocks of the urban environment. In the old days, individual buildings formed streets, piazzas, squares. By, by their conceptual nature, they were additive to create the public realm. Towers have to become just the same thing, building blocks of the urban environment, which means if you're creating public realm, you've got to figure out how is it connective? What is the sphere of influence of a tower? Hmm. How does it affect towers or the street development around it? And out of this comes, I think, concepts in which the connectivity is built into the concept of a tower or a cluster of towers. We also think of towers as singular, but in fact, towers are always, or almost always, neighboring other towers. How do we connect them? At what levels? And why? Mm. And so the more we think of towers not as singular, self-contained, independent objects, but as partners in the urban landscape or environment, the more we start thinking of them as elements which are part of an assembly. And I think that is where we need to transform our thinking from the current, let's be the tallest, singular, most beautiful sculptural object in our city. Mm. I think that makes perfect sense and it would resonate with a lot of uh, urban planners, just ur anyone who would consider themselves an urbanist by any definition and uh, architectural theory, you know. But on the practical level, there's so many factors that are distracting people from that, from thinking of towers as such, right? I mean, the drive to, the, to develop the, a building. At the practical level and also it's sort of purpose ambition level. Yeah. Uh, in other words, we built towers because we need to take advantage of, of the land to be high density because it's concentration. Right. That's the ultimate purpose. But the secondary purposes are identity, uh, they are the ego trip of whoever's building it, and so on and so forth. We need to bring some more balance between the two. Hmm. But even today, as you look at Asia, the, the dominant typology is mixed use, clusters of towers, often over a retail podium or mall. So that is what the market is producing. We don't need to force the market in that direction. So now the question again is, what can you do with multiple towers beyond doing a, with a singular tower? How do you create podiums which by the public intervention are designed to connect to the next and the next so that you start thinking of it more as city because it creates a public realm that's, that's continuous than just these introvert malls that you get into and get lost and could never get out again. Can you think of some buildings that, that you've worked on uh, that take that to heart and how they, how they actually embody that idea? I can give you uh, a couple of, of, I think, dramatic examples. Marina Bay Sands. Of course, in Singapore. In Singapore, mixed use, mostly tourist oriented, but not only, it serves the city in a big way. And here we, we have the help of the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore, who is a hands-on interventionist body who says this building, this complex, not building, is sitting on the new bay that we have created by landfill. It is part of a network of continuous promenades that must be continuous around the river and the bay that are part of what stitches a city together. We take that guideline and we build upon it and amplify it in Marina Bay. What would have been the internal mall is then integrated and interwoven with that promenade, indoor and outdoor, side by side, air conditioned and open to nature. We zone the project in a way that it has a real internal spine, but that spine is part of the city around it. All of it is about connection to the perimeter. Mm. Even the hotels, three of them, three towers, their atria are interconnected to form another 
public street. It's open 24 hours a day to anyone in the city. And you go there and you know it. You're in a public street. Uh, finally, we create a sky park on the 59th level. Parks, playgrounds, restaurants, public observatory. So we've now created, extended the public realm to the 59th floor. And I uh, believe me, it is a very popular public realm space. So that um, every move in that project was about making it, making its density and the development of the tower uh, additive and contributing to mm. the city. As you mentioned in that case with Marina Bay Sands, the Urban Redevelopment Authority public agency was very integrally integral to that uh, becoming such a connected space and to serving these these needs. Um, we're giving you a platform in which with which to serve these needs. Is that always a necessity for a building that will integrate space like that, a, a strong public component, or could the private developer in the United States do the same thing? Um, a very good question, uh, and I have an excellent example. Uh, it is true that when the public agency creates a framework, it is easier. Uh, but we are doing a complex of 10 million square feet in Chongqing mm -hmm. in, in China uh, for a private developer, Capital Land. And I have to confess that in Chongqing, there is no urban redevelopment authority of any resemblance to uh, to Singapore. Uh, it's a very important strategic site. It's the birthplace of the city. It's at the convergence of the two rivers. Uh, the equivalent would be rebuilding Lower Manhattan. Mm. Uh, 10 million square feet is probably as much as we're building in the World Trade Center. Right. Um, and in the absence of guidelines, we put them forward mm. uh, as professionals with the support of our developer client. We said that the commercial podium, which is 2 million square feet of retail, should be an extension of the city streets just running through the project and culminating in the public piazza that's already there at the tip of the city. Uh, we created multiple, eight towers to be exact, multiple towers in a way to maximize light and air in between them and views. And then we crowned them with a conservatory that has, again, a lot of public facilities. So. Each of these moves was actually generated by us, even though at the, in this particular instance, now, since there were three competitions for that site, uh, two of which were rejected by the city for not having brought the results they like, and we were part of competition round eight, uh, three, I can report to you that most projects uh, most proposals treated this as an object, usually a singular tower, sometimes a pair of towers, uh, very introvert, very much turning the back to the city. We won that on the strength of the fact that in that particular case, the city fathers, uh, leaders, recognized qualities that they did not articulate, but they recognized them when they saw them. Hmm. So it sounds like this idea can sort of speak for itself. But I imagine a lot of people want to see a flashy building. They want to see the rendering with the iconic, that's always the word, super tall, uh, shining tower, and, and they want that statement. Is it hard to convince people of, well, of connectivity being as important you're as... You're setting this as a, as, a, as a black and white situation, which it is not. Uh, both Marina Bay Sands and uh, the uh, Raffles City in Chongqing, which I just referred to, are very iconic. The fact that they're not singular towers has not made them less iconic. In fact, the Marina Bay Sands is the icon of Singapore. It's on the postage mm -hmm. stamps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, with due humility, would say that the Chongqing project when it is built is probably going to be one of the most recognizable complexes in China. Mm -hmm. So I don't think by taking the singular tower object away uh, and replacing it by a more comprehensive, cohesive, uh, integrated environment, you are riding off the potential for being iconic or memorable or an exciting place to be in. Mm. No, well said, and those are good examples. Do you think ever the uh, economic pressure of developing in uh, very dense uh, cities would make that sort of connectivity easier or more difficult uh, because you would have more difficulty separating a large tower project into several 
you might be closer to other buildings already by definition, but you'd have a small site. How do you see that land use economics playing in? I think that the economics in terms of just funding and returns sure. is not an issue. I think that connectivity will contribute to the economic model of projects. I think in time it will demonstrate that that's the good business, uh, good business judgment mm. uh, to follow. I think what is a very uh, a major uh, uh, retardant and, and problem for this is the absence of planning tools land ownership tools, often legislative tools um, in the regulatory realm uh, to make these things uh, possible. What uh, sort of tools would be helpful? I think that uh, currently we have zoning and sometimes we have some urban design guidelines. These have to be expanded to recognize that zoning needs to start feeding uh, the character of a building all the way up three-dimensionally that it's not simply a land use uh, 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 tool. And that urban design has to be expanded. And I'll give you a vivid example in New York. Uh, everybody is celebrating the High Line. Mm -hmm. uh, great creation of a, of a public space. Everybody loves what it's done for the city. Step two, the land around it has appreciated. Developers have grabbed all the pieces of land. Uh, within a few years, uh, with the proliferation of towers along the High Line, they're all just pinching into it. It's going to be a canyon. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the High Line we love. Mm -hmm. um, if there were strong planning, uh, uh, if there was a strong planning, urban design and planning institution, easily guidelines that said the building profile uh, around the High Line should be should be controlled by a cone of vision that sort of radiates out of it. So you push the towers back and you let them terrace or you know, step down towards uh, the high line. You'd get the density, you'd get the value in terms of real estate, but the high line would be basically celebrated by these buildings instead of crowded by these buildings. Mm -hmm. But that takes a resurrection of planning and urban design as a respectable way to control development. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're lacking in most cities today. So I think that is the area where we need to really make some advances. Hmm. And hopefully developers would, developers would recognize that in the long run, it's, it's not detrimental to development, that, that it can actually enhance development if it's done in a comprehensive and sensitive way. Do you have hope that that uh, desire for strong planning guidelines will be, as you put it, resurrected? I think it depends on the jurisdiction on the country. I think certainly in the United States, we are, I hope, at the tail end of a, an era of some several decades in which the dictum is the market knows best. You don't intervene with the market. Well, the market knows best about lots of things, but not certainly urban planning. We have no evidence that the marketplace has been sensitive to urban planning. It's too short term in its, in its perspective. And so I think uh, we need to overcome the, the kind of phobia that planning is uh, anti-democratic. It's actually, it's a regulatory measure for capitalism, but it is not anti-democratic. Uh, and I think there is a lot of uh, public uh, education needed here because we've got to reverse a whole trend which basically says you should not do much planning at all. Mm. Government is bad, therefore planning is bad. Mm. Uh, but in other jurisdictions, uh, certainly in countries that have more centralized uh, government like China, it's a non-issue. All you need to have is a conviction by the leadership that it's, it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore is a probably the best example in the world where that's been happening for years with excellent results. And certainly Europe has a, mm -hmm. has a rich planning tradition that is still intact. So mm -hmm. it depends on the jurisdiction. Hmm. That's really interesting that you're in some ways fighting forces of history or you know, self-identity as a nation that, that we don't want to be told you know, what's right for us, even if it's us telling our government representatives. That's been our dilemma right. for 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting to hear it from an architect's standpoint, articulated so. 
Um, so we've been talking about public space being integrated into buildings uh, today, last year, all the time. Um, something you're very familiar with. Are there new frontiers for integrating public space throughout uh, private tower projects that you find interesting, uh, exciting, inspiring as an architect? I think every time I see a connection made at various levels between towers that has a public purpose, I'm excited about it. And I think that's sort of pointing the way. I've just coming out of the competition jury of the students uh, tower competition and one of the projects that we recognized I guess without naming it yet I can say the one who, that uh, won it uh, indicates what potential there is when two towers that form in this particular case a university are connected um, and that the public life that you can associate easily with the university is, is, uh, is enhanced by this connectivity again or how the building is approached from the ground so I think that uh, the potential of creating public space at various levels, access to the public at various levels. Stopping to think of the high-rise building as being a private domain that sits over a podium that's connected to the city, but multiple connections with activities at different levels, that's the way of the future. Hmm. One more question on this notion of, of connectivity. Um, it makes so much more sense, it seems like, when the city is already dense, um, when there's already other amenities to connect to. But what about in cities elsewhere where they're very auto-oriented, where they're sprawling, where there's not so much zoning? I don't know, a place like Houston, or, or you could pick any number of examples. But can buildings respond to their context in such a sensitive and, and effective way when, when the context is already sprawling and auto-oriented as opposed to pedestrian? I think we've got to separate the kind of suburban American tradition from just sprawling cities. Uh, I'm involved with a complex in Jeddah, mm. uh, which is basically not a sprawling city in the American sense, but it's, lower, it's a basically mid-rise city. Mm -hmm. And it's now jumping scale. And uh, in this conference, the, we are seeing featured the Kingdom Tower, which will be the tallest right. tower in the world. Right. Well, it's the tallest tower in the world in a city that has very few high rise right now, so it's certainly not being built out of necessity of density. Mm -hmm. And that demonstrates, first of all, that, that, that tall building construction does occur, even where the, there's low density. We're building next to it uh, quite a high density complex uh, in which same issues arise. So I suspect when you look at downtown Houston uh, or downtown Dallas, the same issues will occur because the, the generally the density occurs, the, the tall buildings occur in quite a concentration. Uh, I remember a few years ago flying by helicopter over Sao Paulo hmm. and what was essentially a three-story city. Uh, completely sprouted with endless towers. You could, your eye just couldn't see the end of them. Yeah. Um, so I think it doesn't take long before the sprawling low-density city jumps. And I'll never forget the fact that when I visited China for the first time, 1973, there wasn't a single high-rise building in Beijing or Shanghai, not hmm. one high-rise building. That's in my lifetime. Well, and now the high-rise capital of the world. You can't count them. <laughs> yeah. Are there, to our, question, to our conversation earlier about planning and guidelines, um, are there things that these cities should be doing as they head towards this inevitable, it seems like in many cases, jump to sort of this new condition that you just described? I think they've got the opportunity. When I think, for example, about uh, Shanghai and I think about the Pudong area, mm -hmm. basically a collection of towers with some podium development un unrelated much to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, at the uh, 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 you know, master plans that preceded, which tried to make sense out of that, uh, you know, the Richard Rogers plan for, uh, for Pudong, which tried to make sense of how these very high density clustering of towers could make sense more as a, as a workable piece of city you see what missed opportunities occurred. And I guess the advice to those cities that are now joining the thing is to act early, because when they do act early and uh, create meaningful master plans that, uh, that uh, foresee the pressures uh, 
ahead of time, much, much better results will occur. Mm.